Stephen Thomas, welcome to the show. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you. So I first got to hear you on uh, Sean, uh, Sean Baker's podcast, Rivero, and you had a lot of interesting things to say. And why don't you give us a backstory, a back background of yourself for those who might okay. not know you? Okay. Uh, yeah, well, I started off many, many years ago in my teens. I'm 58 now. Uh, as a semi-professional footballer and tennis player, I won one singles title. Um, I never was going to be professional and fantastic at tennis because I'm only five foot ten. Uh, and I was a high carb um, believer then. And um, I did a bodybuilding tournament when I was 23. So I had great muscles and abs. It was all natural, by the way. And again, that was high carb. And I can remember thinking this is the way to eat because it's how everyone should be eating, you know, skimmed milk and porridge oats and fruits and freshly squeezed orange juice, uh, trimming off the fat, avoiding red meat. So I did all those things. And so did my parents. But sadly, both of those died when I was very young. Uh, my mum was one of those that had cereal for breakfast and skim milk and did everything that you're supposed to do. And at 53, she had colon cancer. So uh I didn't question the food then. I just thought that was bad luck or genetics. And obviously I worried a little bit because, you know, genetics is pushed at the moment. Actually, it's a bit of a hot topic. Um, anyway, uh, I continued down that path. And then um, obviously as I got older, I wasn't doing the soccer or football, depending on what part of the country you're in or world you're in, I should say. And um I noticed that even though I wasn't drinking and I wasn't smoking and I was eating really healthily, my health actually wasn't good. So um, once I stopped being competitive in sport, I trained to be a personal trainer because I'm really interested in health, really love the gym. Um, so in my 30s, I started doing that. And then I did an advanced certificate. I was lucky enough to train an Olympic javelin thrower and really got quite good and trained some people in running. And I started to notice, notice my health deteriorating even more. So I experimented with uh, things like six months on soy-based stuff. That was no good. Um, and then I got into my 40s and I was a middle distance runner and doing pretty well and coaching people for running. I, I took a a very fat, overweight person in their 50s and made them in the top 20% of the world marathon runners. So that was, was pretty happy with that. And um, I was very frustrated because I could train people and I knew what you should be doing, but I wasn't getting the results that I get now, by the way, as a carnival coach. But anyway, sorry, very long story, but I, I'm going to give it linear to you so it all makes sense. So then I got into my 40s and I started to want to branch out into more specialist fields. So I got a qualification as a specialist practitioner in obesity and diabetes. And it was the diabetes qualification that made me start to really question what I'd learned all my life or been told all my life, because in the classes, constantly talking about the medications, it was always in relation to carbohydrates. And I was the guy in the class that would put his hand up and say, surely we should just reduce the carbohydrates. If they're that bad for people, we should uh, do that rather than just increase medications. Now, looking back, that is such an obvious statement. Uh, but at that time, that was laughed out of the room. Uh, so was fasting. Oh, you've got to eat six times a day. Otherwise, you're going to collapse, you know, and um, the uh, ad advocates for the blood glucose monitors for diabetics were shouted down. The doctors didn't want um, blood glucose monitors in the patient's hands and at that time I can remember that the mantra was they must eat first thing in the morning these diabetics because their blood sugar would be really low of course now we know that isn't true and in fact the dawn phenomena the, the you know the early morning high blood glucose is actually the issue so um, that's another matter anyway so uh, I started to question things and uh, then I branched out as well because I wanted to do phlebotomy. I wanted to be the coach that could do everything, that could uh, train people in exercise, help them to lose weight, help them to reverse their diabetes. And also if they needed blood tests, I could draw blood and uh, hook up with a lab and all that sort of stuff. That's another thing I did. So I got into being a qualified phlebotomist. So that's that's been very handy. Also did a uh, Bachelor of Science Honours degree in Physiology and Health Sciences. So I was getting really qualified, but I was finding that what was actually happening in real life to me made no sense because I was following the rules. I was getting tubbier. 
I was running three times a week. I was doing at least 10 miles three times a week and I was eating healthily, not smoking, not drinking. And before you know it, I was having a colonoscopy because I had lower left quadrant pain. I was overweight and I was pre-diabetic because one of the things I did when I got my phlebotomy qualification was make sure I, I did a full panel on me. And those numbers were shocking, absolutely shocking. Uh, I also then went and had a coronary artery calcium scan and told the radiologist, I think this is going to be really bad. I've started to learn how bad carbohydrates are for me. And uh, they looked me up and down and said, oh, I know you got a bit, you, know, you, you look all right. You'll be all right. And of course, the score was 639. Not the worst. Yeah, I can see in your face. That's pretty bad. Not the worst I've heard, by the way. I've heard of thousands and I've, I've had one much bigger than that as well. Uh, not me personally, but with clients. And um, I just realized I'd been lied to all my life about nutrition. Absolutely lied to. So I started to research myself, low carb for me, not for my clients. And of course, um, if you looked at every metric, you know, my weight plummet uh, in a good way. Um, my muscle mass started to go up. My body fat started to go down. All the things that allegedly you can't do at the same time, which is gain muscle and uh, lose fat. But of course, you can do that if you're eating the right things. So come 50, I decided to go low carb and the results for me were so phenomenal. I started to talk to clients about low carb and that was pretty good. And then, of course, I did the thing that everyone else does. Well, if lowering carbs is really good, what if I lowered them even more and I started to be interested in the ketogenic diet? Uh, got myself a keto mojo so I could measure my glucose and my ketones. I'm smiling now because these days are behind me now. But it's interesting when you first get into it to see the truth of what happens to your body when you eat certain things or when you eat other things that you've been told have been bad for you. So uh, I was pretty hooked on that because, again, the results just improved. And then on my 55th birthday, I decided to do a 30 day challenge. At this point, I was uh, trained to be a carnival coach and a fasting coach with Sean Baker at, uh, it was then called Meet RX. Totally convinced that this was the right thing to do. And um, I was holding, uh, obviously this is before the restrictions, we were holding meetings once a month with groups of 10 people and absolutely everybody was losing weight, everybody's body composition was going fine. It was a real vast range of ages you know um 77 we had people in the 30s in the 40s so it wasn't just a particular group uh some were exercising some weren't but to a person they all improved and this happened every single month so i was totally totally convinced and then i did this 30-day challenge for carnival I could not believe how much better i got again I really couldn't believe it and i'm not pre-diabetic i'm not allergic to any foods which I used to be, I used to be allergic to shellfish and all fish, yeah, even the smell same. of fish. I was hospitalized twice uh, eating fish, and um, that's not the case anymore. My hearing has improved. I wear hearing aids. I've got a um, an app on my phone, which in the last three years, I've had to turn the volume down less and less and less as, as that has cleared up. Uh, little things like the you know athlete's foot, which I'd had since I was about 18 till about 50. Um did everything that you're supposed to do, powders in your socks, powders in your shoes, uh, acid, uh, duct tape, all the things that you're supposed to do, cl really cleaning your feet and drying them and all that. Didn't get rid of uh, athlete's foot, just eating carnivore, totally gone. It's totally gone. Used to have a rash come out if I was tired or stressed, looked like someone got a strawberry and put it against my forehead. Uh, that's stopped. I can't remember the last time I had that. Uh, so skin's got better. Uh, muscle mass did an experiment last year where I really went for a different type of training. Uh, I've been in the gym, like I say, since, uh, since I was 14, actually. And here I am uh, in my fifties, late fifties, and I gained nine pound of muscle. And on the phlebotomy side of things, my testosterone from going keto to carnivore in three months went up 30%, completely natural. Um, so, I was really convinced, obviously, because it was really working for me. And only today I spoke to a coaching client who was absolutely so surprised that in the first eight days they've lost 10 pounds. And I said, yeah, a lot of that's water weight, but don't worry. You, um, 
will slow down, but you will keep losing weight if you keep doing this. But, you know, weight in a good way, the body composition will be better. And I actually told him the story. I said, you know, when I was a personal trainer and I was high carb, I would have celebrated 10 pounds like you would not believe. I would have thought that was amazing. I said, but since I've been doing this and I'm now well over 500 clients in, uh, I think I've got about 100 success stories on video now. Um, you know, I, I've it ranges from 150 pounds, 122 pounds, 112 pounds, 80 pounds, 56, you know, real serious numbers when it comes to uh, weight. But the bigger thing is about the medication. So obviously the diabetic side of things, people getting off the diabetic medications is incredible, um, which I didn't get when I was doing high carb at all. Never got that. Um, coming off like metformin, obviously with their doctor's approval, because their numbers just get better and better. Their daily blood glucose monitor really shows them what's going on. Uh, if they're lucky enough to have fasting insulin and C-peptide and all that, they can look at their insulin levels as well. Many people in America and Canada, New Zealand and Australia and Germany, I have clients all over the world and some of the labs are just fantastic. They will do all these tests, not so, so much in the UK, sadly. C-peptide is really difficult to get in the UK, but it's a good proxy for insulin. So um, right across the board, as a phlebotomist, I see improvements. Uh, as a personal trainer, I see improvements. As a nutrition expert, um, I see improvements. So whichever hat I'm wearing, you know, everything resolves. And it's, it's, it's crazy because it's so obvious. If you take out certain things that are going to be deleterious to you, you're going to feel better. And that doesn't mean going lock, stock you know, and two smoking barrels straight away. Um, some people are reluctant to do carnivore and I, I, I suss that straight away when talking to them. So we remove like processed foods and refined carbohydrates and sugars and they feel better. And then they might have some niggles and I say, well, you know, how far do you want to go? Let's have a look at some other things. And we talk about fruit and veg. We talk about the fact that fruit is seasonal and, um, depends on where you're born and all these sort of things, whether you'd even have access to that. So we take the fruits out. Um, we take the veg out because of the anti-nutrients and you end up with somebody who can't believe all this, you know, and, and when you look into the science of say, for instance, apple growers, you know, when you go to the supermarket, that apple is likely to have been picked over a year ago because they use controlled atmosphere storage, pears about eight months. So you're not eating a fresh fruit. You're eating a fruit that's been manipulated in a cold um, storage facility. Some of the fruits have like um, coverings put on them. And these facts are readily available. I, I actually got these from the Apple Growers Association and from the FDA and the US, US Department of Ag Agriculture. You can get all this. Um, and the nutrient level, obviously, of the fruit absolutely diminishes the longer it's in that cold storage. So it's a, it's easy to talk to people about these things because once they take them out, they feel better. They feel so much better. They see it in their blood glucose monitor. Um, obviously, fructose is a big problem because that doesn't show up on a glucose monitor. But we always talk about glycation and uh, whether fructose is actually going to be good for you or not. Um and then the sweetness comes out of their diet, which is a big thing because there's a lot of cravings. Obviously, the food companies are looking for that bliss point, you know, the hyper palatability of foods. They know what they're doing. They want to make you addicted. And uh, people are, um, like I say, coaching today, a couple of people. One was absolutely addicted to chocolate, found it incredibly hard to give up, even though they knew it was bad for them. But if you start to withdraw from those, you will get rid of those cravings, you replace food. It's not a case of taking things out. It's a case of swapping stuff. So instead of having um, chocolate, for instance, for that particular person, I said, well, do, do you like cheese? You could have a bit of cheese. You could have some ham. You could have a really nice uh, boiled egg or something, uh, anything like that. That's a bit unctuous, a bit of bacon, you know, all nice, juicy foods. And they're quite surprised at first because they're fearing fat. 
which is another subject. I think you picked me because you know I can talk a bit, so I'm going to carry on and get to the end of uh, this little introduction. So, so that's how I that's how I operate. Obviously, the exercises like the butter on the steak. I don't push the exercise because, again, another thing that happens is people start to want to exercise, want to move. Sure. It isn't it isn't a thing that I push on people. I just wait for them because the thing is they will keep to that once they do it themselves. If they're pushed into it, the sustainability is not so good. But once the person says to me, do you know what? I want to start exercising. Then you know that there's a commitment there and, and they bought into it. I'm, I'm not saying you have to exercise at all because you don't have to. It's obviously good for you. Um, as long as you don't overdo it as people overdo it. So I was a big experiment basically for, a few decades of doing the right things. And of course, in the carnivore space, the keto space, low carb space, this story is really common, really, really common. And everyone's very cross with the, the food um, guidelines, you know, eat well or whatever you want to call it. It's, it's complete mockery. It, you know, and the latest thing cool. is it's genetics, which isn't because um, you can prove that by actually talking to people that are obese and say, well, what happened when you started eating the right way and you lost 150 pounds? Did you swap your DNA? Did you change your genetics? And of course they didn't. So that's laughable. And that, that's very, that's very sad. Um, I don't want to get too political because I think this is going on YouTube, but when someone is going to be in control of the food guidelines and they genuinely think that obesity, well, I don't know if it's genuine, there, there is a motive there, I think. Um, yeah. They think obesity is genetic and not at all related to the diet. You think, well, what is the world coming to? Because that is, there's zero sense to that. Genetics, it isn't. It's about environment because I know from my own story, from absolutely everybody I speak to, what your parents or your guardians or whoever looked after you when you were young, what they ate or what was available to you, that's what you had. I don't remember ever confronting my dad or my mum and saying, do you know what? I really want a ribeye. I don't want any of this cereal. I'm sorry. Just that it doesn't happen. So obviously if your family has got obesity or problems and it's because of what they eat and you're in that environment, there's a big chance you're going to actually eat the same and, and act the same. You know, we are very like the people that look after us, not everybody, but it's clear that it's diet, it's clear that it's lifestyle, it's clear what is causing the problems, absolutely clear, but unfortunately this message does not make much money for the big food companies and the pharmaceuticals. So, you know, the food companies want to keep sticking seed oils into all their foods because it's profitable, it can stay on a shelf, it won't It won't go rancid, well, it, it does go rancid, but it doesn't um, it officially doesn't go rancid. Yeah, it doesn't officially go rancid. So they've got this sell-by date. It's, it's very, very profitable, but it is it's, it's horrendous stuff, horrendous. So your cell membranes will not be liking you for having seed oils. So, yeah, uh, I think I would say that low carb not only improved my body composition, but also my cognitive ability and my clarity about what's going on in the world. And when I was at Meet RX, I'll be, and I've said it to Sean, you know, to him, I thought he was too political when I first went on to Meet RX. I thought, come on, don't worry about the politics. Let's just talk about diet. Let's talk about nutrition and eating meat. But I 100% now understand why, because the more you get into it, the more you realize that people are pushing and pushing and pushing. And my research, when I'm doing research and I'm looking for a study, you have to be really careful with the keywords you're looking for, because even when you're researching, even when you're um, trying to be as open as possible, the narrative is pushed at you, constantly pushed sure. at you. You know, I was doing some research on um, essential, what's essential, right? We just don't know if we get to nitty gritty. Are carbohydrates essential? Of course, they're not essential. So when you start doing the research, you will actually see in the same study many times uh, the categorical statement that carbohydrates are not essential because we make them da, 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 da. If you carry on reading the study, they will even use the word essential and say, but carbohydrates are essential because otherwise you're going to be deficient in the same study. And then when you challenge the study, which I have done, I have said, you know, you've said this at the beginning, you can contact the authors and you can get replies if you're persistent, especially when I was studying. Now I've got the degree. I don't do this so much. And you, you query it and say, you say it's not essential. Then you say it is essential. And you've said these reasons. Could you back this up? 
And tell you, every time the every time the challenge, not one was able to back up the eating fruit and veg is essential element. Um, so there you go. Uh, so thanks for asking. That's uh, that's me <laughs> in a nutshell. I think I took fifteen minutes. Hope your audience is still awake. Yeah, of course, it was amazing, and there were so many things. Uh, there are so many things that uh, requires unpacking. Uh, let's start with the um, political motives, and some apologists would say that if you tell people to change their diet, that would be a difficult change. Though at the same time, they are pushing the agenda that you should be eating high carb, and we see people like us. We were looking for some source to tell us what to do, and we did it. And we got where we were obese, we were pre-diabetic, we were uh, sick all the time and constantly uh, tired. So they say the problem is non-compliance if we tell people to do stuff. But af uh, but uh, absolutely the problem is too much compliance to do what we are being told. Yes, absolutely. This blaming the person mm -hmm. is clever. It's a clever tactic because um, it, it gives the food companies a free pass. It gives the pharmaceutical companies a free pass. But it's absolute rubbish because there are people who have followed the guidelines and who, I mean, I am one of those, but there are thousands yeah. out there and they've started to have problems. And you're not exactly seeing a population that's well and, uh, you know, got good body compensation, comp composition and they're fit i mean everything's going the wrong way and the correlation between obesity and red meat for instance or saturated fat consumption when you look at every single metric the reduction in saturated fat the reduction in red meat consumption that's everywhere it's absolutely plummeted as a population but obesity heart disease diabetes metabolic syndrome all of those have gone up and if you do overlay different graphs, you will see the consumption of seed oils seems to go up. The consumption of fruits and vegetables goes up. And yeah, I know that correlation is not causation, but it's pretty interesting to see the incidence of all these different diseases are still going up, even when the foods that are basically species specific like uh, ruminant animals, you know, essential fatty acids and fats from from animals that's all going down. Everyone is eating the stuff that's being pushed and everyone is getting sicker and fatter. So it really is that simple. It's an absolute no brainer, but it is not the person's fault. I mean, when I was doing the obesity training, that was one of the things that I had already realized that these people are not coming in. They're not lazy. They're not greedy. They were undernourished i mean it's one of the things in the steak and butter gang that I, I do like weekly meetings talking about health concerns and fat loss and fitness and all that sort of stuff i often say this the people that were coming in were obese were malnourished in some way normally not enough protein that would be the biggest thing and they're eating more and more sorry i don't know if that was me there with a reminder um eating more and more food because literally they, they want to the, the body is crying out for protein it's crying out for nutrients and I would say I didn't really meet anyone that was greedy or lazy. I met people that genuinely thought they were doing the right thing or they had a bit of a craving. Yeah, they had a bit of a problem with chocolate or whatever. Um, chocolate or sugar addiction is is a real thing. But once you get to talk to people about, um, well, you won't crave that if you were eating properly. If you're fully fed and you have the nutrients you want, those cravings will go can't say that for everybody obviously i always put a proviso in uh, but for the majority of people that is enough to stop the cravings i mean i get into other stuff um you know how you talk to yourself what you say like the subconscious mind is incredible it doesn't really deal with negative so getting up in the morning and saying i'm not going to have sugar i'm not going to have donuts is is not the way to go because you're talking in negatives and and you know, if I said to the audience now, don't whatever you do, think about a pink elephant riding on a on a bus, you would you've got to conjure that image up to not think about it. So I was look at even little tweaks like saying, right, today you're going to wake up and you're going to eat protein and animal fats. Don't say, you know, the other things, just be positive, push yourself to be working with your subconscious mind as well. And don't put ideas into your head. 
so it's it it is it is sad that they try to blame the consumer because it isn't the consumer it's definitely deliberately manipulated foods and marketing it's it's crazy what they do and how they push it on children um how they get children addicted to sugar and sweetness early on it's absolutely scandalous and then when you look at things like the american diabetes association website getting funded by coca-cola and pepsi you're not going to get a fair um crack of the whip you're not going to get you're not going to get that because you've got to look at the funding and the thing is if you if you are a mushroom grower then mushrooms when you're asked about mushrooms you're going to say they're fantastic it's, it's really obvious and, and, cook, and that's business that's fine if that's what you do but then if you were the consumer would you say well that that person knows their stuff therefore i'm going to buy mushrooms or would you go well yeah hang on a minute he's selling mushrooms let's ask him about some other food and see what he says about that and you're going to get different opinions about everything and then and then if you go and you know it's the old thing about if you go to ask for um oranges and the person's only got apples they're going to sell you apples that's it <laughs> they're not going to send you somewhere else to go and get oranges so um to me it seems really obvious and i think i think people are waking up to what's going on because they can see with their own eyes oh. and there are plenty of people that are changing their diet and the way they eat and their lifestyle and they are seeing resolution of so many different conditions it is still frustrating to hear the story of you know uh, husband and wife the wife goes on this way of eating the husband thinks they're mad they're going to kill themselves you know it's really dangerous all this butter and all this meat is going to give you all these problems six months later you know the wife is looking great the body composition's better they're off their medication they, 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 i'm relating to a few true stories now it's normally actually the female that's got a bit more about them initially and then the husband will reluctantly try it uh, and find that they too lose a bit of weight. They come off their medications, they get better. And then you've got this, this couple who are really healthy and yet their children will tell them they're doing the wrong thing, even though they've seen their parents turn yeah. their life around, you know? And that's the thing we need to try to say that the more people are the example, the better it's going to be because um, those that are skeptic and those that are trying to tell you, you know, to eat these empty calories to eat the sugars to eat the eat, eat the grains eat the cereal they they will eventually have to admit it's not good advice and i know that people in their 20s because i was one of them you know i i didn't believe that i would if i was on the uh the end of your headphones or listening to this podcast and i didn't know me and i was a tw my 20 year old me would not believe a word i'm saying and would be laughing mm -hmm. and thinking what a load of rubbish i know that but i think there's more and more people realizing that actually what i'm saying is is pretty true and there's just hundreds of thousands if not millions of people now uh eating this way and proving that the food guidelines are the biggest mistake why do we need food guidelines because they have been the biggest mistake when it comes to health and nutrition because crime, all the i would say sorry biggest crime i would say because it is intentional yeah. Yeah, it is. It's it, it's not science. It's not nutrition science. It's designed by the food growers. It's about business. It's it's ridiculous. True. Um, I think before we go to the next uh, question, maybe we close this room and come back with the next room. How about that? Okay. The stories of transformation of yourself and of your cli clients were really amazing. People in their 70s, in their 40s, they managed to change their lives. Um, really in a revolutionary way um let's be more specific and ask about uh let's talk about uh the cac scan um about your score and the scores of your clients have you seen a reduction after uh starting a diet uh, dietary uh starting a the carnivore diet or did it just stay the same and did it get it just stopped getting worse yeah, I mean, I haven't been doing carnival long enough to have anyone that's that's done that and and come back for a second CAC score. Mm -hmm. uh, I can find people online, and there's plenty of people that have seen well a few things. One is 
one is stopping the progression. So I've I've noticed that there are a lot of people that have had uh, the progression of the coronary artery calcium scan um, because as a certain percentage that it's going to increase over the years um, and it's disproportionate with people that have that problem, seeing that year on year progression slow down. And yeah, I think there's a few people having a regression. I want to go back and have mine done uh, at the moment, the NHS, the National Health Service, is absolutely flooded. So I'm not going to take a space away from somebody that desperately needs a space because even if you're paying privately, you are taking up room from somebody that might need it a bit more. So I'm not going to do it until that's cleared. I think it's a 12 million patient waiting list. So I really want to do that because I'm pretty convinced that my progression would be either slowed or reversed. Um, but then... I would, would need to do another one, really, because you've still only got two data points and you need at least three to start seeing a trend. But um, everything else that I've had tested, for instance, I've had you know, my arteries tested, so the um, pulse wave velocity and all that sort of thing has improved. My metabolic age, according to like a body scan now, is 43 and I'm 58. So I'm quite happy with what's going on. I feel the best I've ever felt. Like I say, my hearing has got better, but I do, I do feel just the carnivore diet is about the best thing you can do. I know people supplement with D3, K2, uh, CoQ10 and other thing, other things as well. But um, I just believe in nutrition personally. I just feel that's going to be enough to make sure that that's okay. I mean, obviously what's happened there, don't forget that calcium is there as a protective mechanism, almost like nature's stent but it's gone a bit AWOL for, for me and for many others. It's just a bit too much calcium. So um, my wife, incidentally, had a, had the, her CAC done at the same time. And all her life, she has avoided potatoes, bread, pasta and rice, pretty much. Not really a chocolate lover. And it was just a choice, just a taste choice. And um, when I first met her, it's my second wife, I... Um, I couldn't believe how much she was eating. We went out for breakfast, actually. That was our first date. And we both ordered uh, what's known as a full English breakfast. Neither of us wanted um, toast, really. Uh, but I did have things like hash browns and stuff at that point. And I said, how are you eating so much? And, you, you know, you've you got, you got abs and you, your definition. She said, well, I don't eat potatoes and bread. Anyway, uh, long story short, she had a CAC score of zero. Wow. So she'd sort of done keto ish all her life. Uh, and I would say this to your listeners, actually, if you're not convinced about this and you're still eating bread and potatoes, take them out of your life and see the difference because they are two of the biggest culprits. And if you're having lots of sugar in your coffee or tea or something, take that out as well. Because I was, I was into the sweet stuff. I was having two sugars. I was having two uh, brown natural cane sugars because that's obviously healthy in my coffee. And um, even that just once a day was too much. And I realized that now. Yeah. Absolutely realize that. So it's, it's one of those things that practically people that are skeptical can try. Certainly taking out pasta, rice, bread and potatoes and sh sugar or sodas would make a huge difference before you've even started on anything else. Just taking out those culprits would make a big difference. And then um, I think once, once you've done that for a month, you will realize there is something to this. Definitely. I mean, there may be some transitional problems. You might find that you're going to the toilet a bit too much uh, or not enough, or you might have you know, constipation, diarrhea, whatever, um, as your body ad ad adjusts. But in the main, most people do that. Small experiment, always feel better. Yeah, when I started, I just took out the the stuff that were definitely sugary. For example, jam. Even I, I hadn't taken the bread first because I didn't know that it had sugar. <laughs> but even with uh, removing the sugar in... Uh, uh, removing pastries, removing uh, jam, rem removing honey, the things that were clearly sweet i started to see a clear improvement there are some other things that i want to um, go in uh, go into but 
I know that, that there's a limited time I have to choose. One of the interesting things that you raised was food allergies. I had so many allergies that went away, except for one, which is the one that you mentioned. The last time, after seeing so many of my allergies go away, after being on keto and then car carnivore, I was like, how about uh, trying some shrimps? And that was the closest I got to death. And mm. yeah, that was a really bad experience. But could you find some explanation as to why you reverse that kind of allergy? Yeah, I think your your inflammation status first is lower because if you're eating sugars, you're obviously having higher levels of insulin, which is an inflammatory uh, marker as well. I mean, you need insulin, but if it's an inappropriate level, that tends to sort of help with um, inflammation. So you would tend to find, well, I can give you, uh, you know, another practical thing, which I very rarely mention. by the way, you just talked about honey. I used to have terrible hay fever, absolutely terrible hay fever. And um, I tried all sorts of honey, raw honey and local honey, because if it's the honey from bees that are in your local area, that's going to be the pollen that's going to make you allergic and all this sort of stuff. And uh, failed, uh, absolutely failed miserably. But um, I don't think I've had hay fever for probably about six years now. And it's something I haven't really considered uh, until you mentioned the honey there and allergies. And I just put the link together. So, yeah, I think I think um, firstly, your body is less inflamed. That's, that's the first thing. And I think it's also more sensitive to all the signaling. So when you're eating badly, you are pushing all your hormones you're in the wrong way, really, because you're not producing enough of for instance like maybe leptin for instance could be one of those things because you're eating all these carbohydrates and your oh your your adipocytes are a bit overstuffed and i think people don't really understand their hunger this is like speculation but it's just time and time again something i've noticed from real people because they'll suddenly start to say to me do you know i actually know what hunger is now i've lost that signaling and um i also know when i'm when i'm full which I didn't realize. And, and I think it's in the 1950s, they did the Minnesota prison experiment where they looked at um, two sets of prisoners which were allowed to eat whatever they liked, as long as one half of the group were allowed to eat as many carbohydrates as they like. And the other half were allowed to eat as many, um, as much protein and fats. And the ones that were able to eat proteins and fat over eight on average, something like 830 calories a day now these are prisoners so, you know so they're probably bored and you know eating was a bit of a good thing to do they're probably not being given more food than they were needed so i suppose that makes sense but the calorie uh count for the carbohydrate group was something like eleven thousand over every day per person so it seems like you can eat carbohydrates 10 to 11 times more than you can protein well the reason i'm saying that is that shows that there's something wrong with the signaling yeah. because there is no calorie counter in your body. Um, calories are a completely pointless metric, to be honest. Um, but everyone understands them. So we're talking about a volume of food. So the volume of food was 11 times as great as the protein and fat group. Well, something's wrong there. Well, two things are wrong. One is there's that sort of pleasure center being pushed. <laughs> And the other thing is the, whoa, stop eating. You've eaten too much signal. Well, if those signals are messed up, what other signals are messed up? So like your inflammatory response, your release of histamine or your um, diamine uh, oxidase, the DAO enzyme that cleans up histamine, all of these things are going to be dysregulated because you're not eating the right way. It's exactly the same with, um, so your, to answer your uh, allergy request uh, why does that happen it's, it's because the body goes back into a regulation where they can understand the signals not have such a vast histamine response which is you know um, inappropriate and possibly too rapid or possibly that because you've got the building blocks the amino acids to make the enzymes you might there might be more DAO I don't know the full mechanism but it just makes sense to me that this this does seem to happen whatever it is it's the mechanism of whatever brings on the inflammation is mm -hmm. is more controlled and what cleans it up afterwards is 
more efficient. So this happens in every aspect of what I look at. So if you look at someone that's diabetic, obviously type one uh, can't produce enough insulin. But if you talk about type two, where they can produce insulin, what's happening there is the body is trying to regulate the blood glucose and the person, and again, I, I got these details from um, when I was doing phlebotomy. The person is showing you a, a reasonable level of blood glucose management, but we don't know what's happening in the background. How much insulin is causing mm. this perfect looking number? And when you when you are able to look into data where people have had these readings, time and time again, what's been happening in the background is they've required more and more insulin to keep them uh, in inverted commas, normal. And then what happens, there's a tipping point where the production of insulin is so great, they can't keep up, the pancreas can't keep up with this production of insulin, it starts to drop off. And obviously then what happens is the blood glucose goes through the roof. And that's when it's, when it's a bit too late, you are diabetic or you're pre-diabetic. When I say too late, what I mean is you could have, you could have change the way you was eating 15 years previous or 10 years previous and not have this problem that doesn't mean it's not reversible because it is and that's what happens uh, that's what i see time and time again i did it myself and i see it in in clients and it just shows that you can get something that's dysregulated so insulin being that example where it's high inappropriate and then it's low uh the cells are not so receptive to it there's not sensitivity to insulin, but it can be reversed. And I think the same with allergies. You have something enter your body, which your body is uh, detecting as a foreign invader. So you get the appropriate physiological response to rid you of that thing, sneezing to get it out of your nose or mucus to, to, to protect you. And then it clears up because there's always a cleanup operation that um, the body has. The body's pretty smart. And we've seemed to have forgotten that. Definitely in the last um, three years, we seem to have forgotten that the immune system is pretty good and it seems to be ever so effective. So if you feed it right, it's going to work better. And I do think it's as simple as that. And I see many people with skin rashes, uh, rosacea, um, eczema, all these sort of things that we're told are you know, autoimmune or impossible to control you know, that they don't know the cause of it. That's another thing when I'm doing research, you know, uh, or the science doesn't really know why this person will get this. And you think, well, I know because you can resolve it by changing the way you eat. And again, I, obviously that's not for everybody. I can't guarantee that this way of eating will make that happen, but I do see it time and time again, when people do this way of eating, things like allergies that used to be really bad definitely the symptoms lessen or completely go and it is it's just very surprising but it's it's every sort of biochemical reaction every sort of hormonal response anxiety goes people sleep better their blood pressure gets lower so the whole body the regulation of the whole body seems to improve beyond belief and all the metrics are there we can see it time time again um, just from changing their way of eating and it's and it's easy to do it is easy to do it's free <laughs> you know no you haven't got to pay a monthly subscription to do it you haven't got to buy any tablets or potions or pills or anything like that you just have to look at what you're eating think i'm going to take out anything that's man-made or human made i should say um anything that's processed anything that's got refined carbohydrates start there have a serious think about fruit and veg and whether there really is a place for well vegetables that don't want to be eaten. They're full of compounds that are going to try and kill insects or any invaders. And if it's an ethical thing about the, you know, well, I don't want animals to die. Well, you can't have fruit and veg. I used to grow fruit and veg and it was like Fort Knox. And I would have every pesticide and every herbicide and every trap, because if I didn't, I would have no fruit and veg left because there was, you know, butterflies and caterpillars and mice and uh, rats and there were you know birds and every sort of animal wanted to eat badgers every sort of animal wanted to eat what I was growing and that's fine because that's nature that's really good so if you if you're eating a banana and you're thinking well this is great because no animals died then you're living in cloud cuckoo land I'm sorry yeah. but that's what pesticides are that's exactly what they do 
pesticide you've only got to look at the word you know yeah. that is there to kill those animals simple as that and it it, it kills the soil so you've got microbes mm -hmm. you just ruin nature by having these things now it's very i've got an apple tree out the back and we're just trying to let that go naturally and one of the things that we're doing i uh, gave the apples away last year is just to let the spiders build their webs and let the animals self-regulate it now that is sustainable and that's pretty healthy but it's not going to make them a lot of money True. and that's why you won't get healthy um guilt-free fruit and veg because that's not how they do it they just basically go and do a monocrop cover it in plastic fill it full of chemicals and uh, kill everything in sight and ruin the natural habitat for those animals so um i don't think anyone that's eating fruit and veg from the supermarket has uh, got a clean conscience and uh, i didn't want to get political but it's become a political thing because you know, many people think, well, you're a carnivore, but animals die for carnivore. Well, they die for everything you're eating, uh, sadly. I mean, you, you can even get into, well, you know, the soil is the the uh, degradation of animals from many, many, many years ago. So even the soil actually mm -hmm. is from dead animals. So you, how far do you want to go with this? Yeah. We are so detached from the production that we think that if there is no blood in our plate, then there is uh, no blood in the process at all. But if you yeah. even have an apple tree in your yard, if you grow veggies in your garden, you would see that for growing them well, you need to kill those snails, kill, kill those pests. Hmm? Yeah, snails is another one. I should should add that to my list. <laughs> because, you know... I, I find it very frustrating because there are a lot of very militant vegans. Uh, and I heard of a family where they said, oh, my daughter is vegan and we have to sit in the garden if you want to have any meat. And I said, why don't you tell your daughter that whatever she's eating has probably flown uh, two and a half times around the world. I, I'll actually tell you something about a picture I looked at from Greta, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yes, Say to it, well, do you think those veg grew without any animals or any pests being killed? Or not pests, actually, don't say that, because that's a word used so they can get rid of pests. Yeah. They're still animals. Yeah. They're still animals. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm sure they didn't say that to the daughter, but I would, definitely. But yes, um, about three years ago, there was a picture of Greta on a train, and it was saying um, on her table she had her food, which is all in plastic containers. And you could see what the food was. So I looked up the air miles for that table for that one meal. And it it was the equivalent of two and a half times around the world that food had flown. Mm -hmm. Two and a half times around the world. So uh, is that is that good for the planet? I don't think that's good for the planet. Because I, so. I tell you what, the, the, the veg that I grew in my garden, yeah, that's local, but... What I was eating, like bananas and oranges and stuff like that. I mean, the, an orange, that's 800 miles in a plane. That's not even included in the trucks that then deliver it. Yeah. And also the energy and putting it in cold storage for a long period of time. So, um, and are they natural? Of course, they're not natural. I mean, all the fruit that we eat is completely different to what it used to be. Completely different. It's all hy hybrid. Uh, all the veg pretty much is a hybrid. There's nothing much in the fruit and veg canon that is is natural. Well, there's nothing. There is nothing that's originally like it was even four or five hundred years ago. Of course. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time, though. Uh, there are so many other things that I would have liked to get into. Hopefully we can okay. have you some other time before yes. uh, we wrap up. Could you let us know where we, uh, we can follow you, follow the content that you put out? Yeah, um, okay. Um, my website is uh, theukcarnivore.com. And most of my stuff, if you look up the UK Carnivore, so on Instagram, uh, let me get my my links up. I will send them to you. Uh, I have now a podcast, 
which is on Buzzsprout, but you can get it on uh, Spotify mm-hmm. or you can get it on Apple. So you just search the UK Carnivore. Um, I think the website is the easiest thing to get me on, to be honest. And uh, yeah, what's my, my Instagram is the UK Carnivore. So I, I'm easy to find. Okay. The UK Carnivore. Well, don't forget that. Uh, thank you for your time again and have a great rest okay. of the day. Yeah, thank you. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of Round the Fire. If you are watching this video on YouTube, please give it a like and hit the subscribe button. If you're listening to the podcast, please leave the five star review. It would cost you nothing but help me a great deal, especially if you do so on Apple Podcasts. Also, if you feel particularly generous, consider supporting me via Patreon, PayPal, or Bitcoin.